you know, after all, what, what does it mean when we say that um, technology is taking away uh, jobs? It means that you cannot produce more output with uh, uh, fewer labor, with less labor input, and therefore productivity of labor is increasing. And if you look at um, the way economic progress has been taking place, I'm not, I'm not asking you to go and look at the industrial revolution, so I'm asking you to look at this in the last uh, 20 years, even during the lifetime of ISIL, these things have happened. Uh, what's been happening is that there is a very small dynamic sector which is associated with the information and communication technology future, the ICT sector, that employs maybe about 3% of the labor force, not more than that. Even in the United States, it employs about 2.5 to 3% of the labor force. But it is the sector that drives with the rest of the economy because what the ICT sector does is to produce a capital equipment or rather produce technology that is embedded, embodied into new capital equipment. That capital equipment spreads throughout the rest of the economy and productivity rises everywhere. You know, like if you look at um, an office now, if you look at an academic office, for example, you know, what, what is there in your professor's offices? Now, it's completely different from what there was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there would have been a secretary knocking on the door all the time, asking for uh, manuscripts to type and for uh, calendars to keep and all that. Now you knock on the, now you go into the room and what you see is a laptop on the uh, desk that does that work. Well, that's what ICT does. It's the ICT industry that is behind that laptop that uh, makes the person more productive, provided they don't waste their time looking at Facebook and the internet and they focus on their research and uh, calendar activity. Um, now, the, um, so the countries that, that resist that new technology we're obviously losing competitiveness internationally and therefore they are going to suffer in the export markets, they are going to lose markets and um, they are not going to be able to uh, support uh, the rise in their standard of living. They, uh, um, co competition now, if you see internationally most of the trade products, even trade services in fact, which is an increasing fraction of uh, exports in some of the latest statistics. By surprise, by surprise, in fact, something like 25% of world exports are services, they are not goods. And um, those depend entirely on, on new digital technologies. You know, the, the big export services, finance, for example, will have to, have to export financial services without the new uh, digital technologies. If you resist that because it's going to destroy jobs, then you're going to fall behind and other countries will take over. Now, um, it is true, though, to, uh, and, and you have to face it and um, think how can you make sure that that doesn't hurt um, the people who do those jobs. It's true that many jobs will be destroyed, and, and most of the destroyed jobs will be manufacturing industry, because manufacturing industry is the one that can be automated uh, with robotics more than any other industry. And you can see that the, the, the uh, blue line is the European Union manufacturing sector and it's been declining since uh, 1990. The yellow one is the United States manufacturing sector, which has been declining. And in fact, they have been declining since the uh, early 80s, uh, at least. There's, there's a big shock to manufacturing that started declining to in the 70s, and since then, employment followed soon after that, it's been declining. And even in China, which is um, supposed to be the big manufacturing workshop of the world now, a lot of building is made in China, of goods that uh, you see. Except that I see in front of me a German flag and it says this computer was made in Germany. But I can't believe it, but it's a, it's called with an Asian name. I think someone, I think a German student stuck that there to show that not everything is made in China or Japan. And, uh, but even in China, as I would say, manufacturing uh, employment is now declining. Um, all credit to the Chinese for uh, realizing that and for taking action, at least on paper, it looks very good in fact. Uh, for the decline of manufacturing employment. It's not something that, that, that countries should be resisting, it's something that uh, they should welcome in a way because it's, because, because it's taking place because of technological improvements. Um, 
like even now in the United States, which um, industrially is the most advanced technology, is the most advanced country in the world, manufacturing employment is now only about 15 percent of total employment, which is ridiculously small if you think of all the um, manufacturing groups that um, are in uh, American households and offices. It just gives you, it just makes you realize how productive. Uh, industry can be with uh, new uh, digital technologies and non digital, of course, not maybe digital, we're talking about now. Now, uh, of course, you know, how do we learn new technology? We learn it from uh, research and development, R&D. Um, I mean, there is a big discussion in the, uh, in the profession, in the economics profession, and elsewhere, how, does, how do new discoveries come about? Is it too hard to learn? Is it sudden inspiration? I think it's, uh, it's a bit of each. But the important thing is that we do know that countries and companies that spend more on R&D, they, they will discover more things than other countries. Now, we also know that, um, that uh, R&D knowledge is transferable, in technology or knowledge is transferable. We can always learn from the discoveries of others, and we do learn from the discoveries of others. The famous phrase that almost every Big scientists, paraphrases, uh, we stand on, on the shoulders of giants. Even Isaac Newton, a great mathematician, said the only reason I made any progress is that I could stand on the shoulders of, of giants. That yeah. uh, means that you learn from the discoveries of others. Um, I, I, I think that there's also a strong case, and I suspect most people will believe that I haven't discussed it with my colleagues, I'm not sure if they will believe that. Uh, but big countries do need to do their own R&D. If you don't do your own R&D, you're going to fall behind. You know, we can't all be sitting here and waiting for the same company in California to discover the new startup so that we can take it up. I mean, we have to do our own research if we want to compete uh, with them. So, so I thought I'd show you uh, R&D activity in OECD countries um, just to see where the technological improvements come from. Come from. And you will see something that, sh that shouldn't surprise you. The leading country in the world in the R&D is uh, Korea, South Korea, the Republic of Korea. Now, the Republic of Korea in the 1950s was one of the poorest and destroyed by war countries in the world. Uh, there was absolutely nothing taking place. Now, many of the things that you have in your pockets are made in Korea, the Samsung, the, the Hyundai, and, and, and LG, and, and and I know from the, from the discoverer of these things that um, who's not going to benefit from it, by the way, that the next generation of television will be Korean, it will be the, the OLED, the flexible, flexible TV screen. You'll be able to roll up your TV screen if you have guests and you don't want <coughs> to clutter in your living room. Uh, that, that was a discovery that um, that was made at Kodak Labs in the United States, but it was bought up by a Korean company and it's currently developing. Um, you can see it happening. Now, the other Asian country, of course, that's done miracles in new technology is Japan. You can see that it's the third one. And then of the Europeans, you know, Sweden and so on. You might be asking what's Israel doing there in between. <laughs> what, what are the big Israeli names that we see? Well, that's the Israeli army. <laughs> Well, you see, Israeli, Israeli RMB is almost entirely military RMB. You're going to see it in the in fact, I have a and, um, and, and you can see how it goes. I, I highlighted the European Union because I'm a proud citizen of the European Union, still, for a couple of years. <laughs> and uh, if I highlighted China because it's a country that uh, everyone is talking about. But of course, I also highlighted Russia, and as you can see, it's not doing very well. I decided not to uh, highlight my birthplace, which is Greece, because it's even more embarrassing than Russia at least. <laughs> <laughs> so let's not talk about that now. <laughs> you can talk about the Greek islands in the summer, not about Greek scientific activity in winter. Uh, now, here you see I am financed by industry, and that's why uh, as a few you see where Israel stands. As, as you can see, the, the is, Israel is number two in the world in R&D, but in industrial R&D is one of the lowest in the world. Russia, however, is very low. 
I was, you can see his next goal to Greece. Greece is a little, a little bit higher than Russia. <laughs> so there is a lot of military having I mean, what's not here yeah, actually is that this is military, it's having to do military. But again, you can see that Korea, Taiwan, Japan are, are the leading countries. And Germany is the leading European country, which again is not surprising if you see uh, German technological state of uh, German manufacturing things, especially cars and uh, domestic appliances, etc. <coughs> so that's, um, that in a way shows you that, that the countries that are doing well technologically are the ones that are spending more on this in development. But in terms of percentages of GNP, again, they're not very high. You know, like, you see that, that the, the Koreas and Japan and so on spend about 4% of their GNP on R&D. Um, but then, Russia and the East European countries and Latin American countries, in fact, spend less than 1%, which, is, uh, which makes all the difference in these 2 to 3% of GDP. It, it, it's, not, you know, it's not that you have to spend all your time and all your money doing research to discover the new technologies. So the small input can yield a very good output uh, here. Now, what are the implications for jobs? Let's, go, let's switch back to jobs. Well, it is the case that um, all these, um, um, all, all these new technologies, they, um, and they, they, they do replace uh, human labor. There's no doubt about it. Um, and especially the new technology, the one associated with um, digital technologies, they replace uh, mid-level mid jobs, not the low-skill uh, jobs that um, were being replaced by the first industrial revolutions, you know, like the other the British Industrial Revolution, for example, who developed against machines, they were the ones that were fairly skilled craftsmen, I should say, but um, they, they were being replaced by machines that uh, were doing routine things. But mainly, mainly you think of machines as, as replacing manual labor, you know, vacuum cleaning as replacing the person just sweeping the floor, that kind of thing. But in fact, digital technology is replacing mid level jobs. You can see that. Very clearly in offices, I mean, you can see most clearly, in fact, you know, maybe, maybe we can see most clearly because it's the office that we're most familiar with, but the academic offices that are staying in place. You know, when, um, when I first got the job at the, at the LC, there were really sort of three types of jobs that were popular. There were, there were the academics, uh, there were the mid level administrative jobs, secretarial jobs, administ uh, administration. Um, you know, dealing with telephones uh, and, and correspondence, especially. And then there were the lower level jobs that were mainly manual labor, you know, the security people, the cleaners, and all that. Now, if you go to university now, like my university, for example, and I'm sure I said, it's saying, well, you see, you still see the academics are there, they haven't been replaced by machines yet, by the way. Maybe they are not doing research that will replace their jobs in academics. And then you do find the lower level minor jobs, you know, there are still cleaners and security people around. Um, but you don't see many at the mid, the mid level jobs, you know, like all the correspondence being dealt with that by us by using digital means and, and telephones. You, I mean, telephone hardly ever rings anymore. And we go out typing of. Um, Presentation of documents when we want to type it. I mean, obviously, there's still some administration left, but nothing like the share of employment that they had 20 years ago. And that's the kind of replacement that, that, that you get. You know, if a lot of us are doing our own accounts at home, for example, because we have spreadsheets that can do these things. You know. So, the, so uh, you know, except, except the Microsoft spread, Microsoft software generally have replaced. A lot of labor, that's what we mean by destruction of jobs. Now, now we do have some famous names actually in economics that, that anticipated that. Keynes, for example, predicted not, not his general theory, but I think some correspondence with uh, our economists predicted that uh, the way technology is going, and he was talking about the 1930s, where there wasn't that much happening. Although, I, no, I take that back actually, there was a lot happening. All the domestic appliances. The refrigerator was the biggest, uh, one of the biggest inventions ever, and that took place in the 1930s, I think, or at least the worst. 
my friend Bob Bolden was here, he would have dismissed me by now if, I, if he heard me saying that no technological improvements in the 1930s, because he claims that that was the period of the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest activity in the invention of new products. Um, and, um, and what he has predicted was that if we, have, if we want to employ your people who want to work, then the week would have to be 15 hours long, not more than 15 hours long. <coughs> instead of 45, that was at least time. Um, now, that, that is not, it's not too bad a prediction, actually. I mean, if, if, I mean putting a number 15 was dangerous, of course, every economist knows you should never mention the numbers when you're making predictions. But you can predict the direction in which things are going. And the fact that hours will be falling is a very correct prediction. I'm going to show you, show you in a minute. Something that really surprised me when I discovered it, when I was preparing for this lecture. Um, in that, in the countries with uh, lower productivity, who don't have as much technology, who won't use as much technology in their production, uh, usually their people have to work longer hours. And, and their standard of living, the output per head, is a lot less than those who work fewer hours. In other words, the wealthiest countries in the world uh, work fewer hours. Now, the economists sometimes call that. Uh, that the leisure is a normal good, and if you become wealthy, you don't buy more leisure, and, and, and you're taking it. That, that surprisingly, it is controversial in economics with, um, in recent with people who use uh, time use services to work how to, how to spend their time. But I think, I think the majority, or at least the consensus, is moving in the direction that we do buy more leisure as how standards living rises. But I think what you're going to see. It is not only a voluntary demand for leisure, it's also the fact that technology is pushing in that direction, so leisure becomes a kind of cheaper good to acquire. Now, what you see here is weekly hours of work, and um, the only exception here is Korea, actually, because the standard of living is rising very fast, but they also work in long hours. They work 40 hours a week on average. Now, remember that these, these are average hours of work, it's not what we call the normal work week. Um, but the countries that work longest is Mexico, <coughs> heaven knows which countries, CSR. Any guesses? <laughs> um, Korea, Greece, Chile, Russia, Latvia, Poland, are the countries that have uh, many hours of work. And then the countries that have the lowest hours of work are uh, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, France, they're the countries that have the highest uh, hourly productivity in the world. In fact, I don't know how many of you follow the um, exchanges between um, German politicians and Greek politicians over the debt crisis. And German politicians and the German press especially always accuse the Greeks of being lazy and they don't work, and that's why their country is indebted. <coughs> so, in fact, the most if you measure laziness by the hours you take off work, Germany is the most lazy country in Europe. <laughs> and Greece is the most hardworking country in Europe. <laughs> On the assumption that CSR is not a European country. <laughs> 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 I look at which country it works. It must be a Latin American country. It? No, it's not just that. All right, so, so you can see, you know, this, this is more than Keynes' uh, prediction, and you can see here actually how good this correlation is. I mean, that even keeps Korea in Japan, where they work longer hours. But you can see that, that there's a, a pretty good mechanism correlation between the productivity, um, hour, hour in productivity, and how many hours a week people work. So the more you adopt technology, the more you destroy jobs. Uh, the wealthy you become, and you can take more leisure. And that's another good thing about, uh, about new technology that destroys jobs. It's a good thing. So, she welcome. I hope you discover the new technology that destroys more, more jobs. Now, so, so you could say that Keynes was right to some extent. I mean, it's you know, typical Keynes, and he was right on general ideas, but wrong in the detail. <laughs> but, um, but that's what generates the future research. Uh, hours of work will fall further as technology advances, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have fewer jobs. In fact, 
there will be more jobs created, uh, and and the more we and we can create as many jobs as we want. But these jobs will be created in the service sectors that will be created in sectors where we cannot have uh, automation. Now, closely related to that is something, it's another famous paper written by William Bono in 1967, which gave rise to what's known as Bono's cost disease, where he, he claimed that uh, labor was shifting away from uh, sectors that uh, can be uh, uh, replaced by technology, especially manufacturing and, and most other things, and will be moving in sectors that uh, cannot be automated, which are usually labor-intensive uh, sectors. Now, in those labor-intensive sectors, uh, productivity will not be rising because you cannot adopt new technology. I mean, he used the typical sector that he used that can, cannot be automated is the arts, uh, fine arts, and um, and all that, and, uh, and I was using and I was using some example. I say well, you wouldn't want uh, you wouldn't want to go to a concert where a robot plays the music, and then suddenly somebody raises their hand and says, "Excuse me, there has been a concert where robots play the music." It's <laughs> such, such a concept. Um, anyway, I'm sure uh, I'm sure uh, Sergey's job will never be replaced. <laughs> What about professors, university professors? Well, hopefully one day they'll be replaced by 3D three, three projection and the video frame behind them. <laughs> but uh, this job may be, maybe not. Um, or you wouldn't want um, to, to have robots doing your paintings so that in the, in the galleries, I think it would, it would never happen. That was almost the idea anyway. And, um, and he says eventually, you know, as time goes to infinity, the arts will be the only place which will be employing people, and the rest of us will be, will be taking lots of leisure, but because we'll be owners of machines, they will be, will be wealthy enough to pay for the arts. But then, to induce people to go and work in these sectors, in the arts, you have to pay them well, you have to pay them something equivalent to what to the money that you get by becoming a machine owner and working a few hours of manufacturing. And that's what's known as the cost disease. That technology brings with it a cost disease in that, in that costs in, un in unproductive services in, will be rising all the time through new technology. And we can see that, of course, you know, like the most expensive services that you can buy in, in so many things are in the United States simply because they have technology in the most advanced country. You know, if you, you know, like lawyers will never be automated, unfortunately. <laughs> and, 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 but the lawyers, I think, say, do you think they will be automated? Already the software. <coughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'd much rather talk to the machine about my legal problems than the real lawyer. <laughs> um, but, um, but lawyers are the most expensive. Lawyers are kind of in the United States are extremely expensive because of the technology that advances is taking place in medicine. Because how, how could you automate the lawyer's job by the way? I'm very curious. Okay. Um, okay, so now if you, if you ask a little bit more formally, you know, which sectors would create the jobs, then um, I, I, I think the main sector would be health and care. You know, care, care is one of the things you cannot automate. You know, you wouldn't want, and, and that's not, not only sick people, but including sick people. You know, you wouldn't want a robot to look after your child. Um, I, I don't know, even, even that actually can dispute because Uber is about to introduce the driverless car, but would you, would you want a driverless car to drive your child to school? <laughs> I think maybe not. <laughs> but care though, other than driving, is, is something that cannot be automated. You know, nursing, would you want to go to a hospital and have a, a, a machine uh, looking after you? To some extent, yes, because you know, it's monitoring your uh, heart rate and all that. It's, it's machines, but you, you do need nurses, though. Um, and um, and el elderly care, so all, all people who need uh, care, you need, um, you need people. It's, you know, you need a personal uh, touch. Um, I was, I don't know if you Now, second, that would not, is, that would be a problem of your education, like you were saying, that, that um, Education, especially school education, that you wouldn't you wouldn't want school children 
or I don't think it would be possible to have school children educated by machines because they have to be taught, they have to behave as well and hire machines. I mean, how would you expect a teenager to obey a machine? You know? <laughs> Uh, then, then we have the hospitality industry, where this is Keynes' idea. You know, if we're going to take a lot of pleasure, we do need to have uh, and bomb as well. You know, the hospitality industry, leisure industry includes uh, arts and uh, tourism and all that, which will be employing people in the restaurants, to employ people as chefs. Um, there's another, there's another one of my examples that someone told me I was wrong because apparently there was there were very sophisticated meals recently cooked by robots. They just took the proportions and <coughs> but it's not as tasty as Jamie Oliver. Um, real, real estate management is very big in the, in the United States, especially if it's moving to Europe. And then household personal services as well, that, um, that people just um, uh, give up their machines. You know, there is, there was a tendency, I don't know if I have any, yes, I do have to have a slide there. Uh, okay, now, now why, why am I saying that health and care will be the main one? Well, the reason is partly rising living standards that we have much higher expectations of what care should be like. You know, like in a poor society, you might be suffering from some pain, you might be having a bit of cold or whatever, and you say, oh, well, I don't care, you have to get on. In wealthy societies, that's not the case. You might want someone to look after you, you might want to visit a doctor. <coughs> Who are much more demanding. Um, you, you can see it actually. I mean, like the, the main cause for, for absenteeism on medical grounds from British uh, uh, labour markets is uh, back pain. Now, it's not that suddenly the British population has been hit by back pain it, it's, and, and depression, only these two things, back pain and depression. It's not the case, you know, I think. After the referendum, well, they should be hit by depression, but I don't think that's the reason that there's so much absenteeism from uh, labor markets. It's, it's the fact that you become more aware of these things as you become wealthier. And therefore, as we become wealthier, we're going to become aware of, many, of more medical problems that will need personal care. And the other reason is that societies are aging, and inevitably, you know, older people do have more demands on medical services and care services than younger people. Um, now, the leisure industry, as I mentioned, is because of the former and Keynes argument that we're going to take more leisure. Now, now how, how should services, real estate management, and all that, again, it's associated with rising living standards. I think that there are many, many things that we consider chores that comes to household care and um, office care, and, and we delegate them to specialist companies that do these jobs. That's, that's, the, that, that's the irony the way of, um, of domestic service. You know, back, back in the beginning of the 20th century, um, well off families would employ two or three uh, assistants. You know, there, there, was a, there was a cleaner, there was a, 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 a care person, there was a, a, a seamstress you know, for, for mending clothes. There's a really, there's a wonderful PhD that's written at the University of Pennsylvania in 1910 by someone called John Leeds, where he describes all the domestic services done by, uh, required by American families. And, well of American families, and well of American families were not, were having something like three or four uh, full-time employees, domestic employees. Then with the discovery of all the domestic appliances, all, that, all those jobs were destroyed, they disappeared. And people were doing their own jobs. You, know, you would do your own uh, cooking, your own shopping once a week, installing a refrigerator, your own cleaning back again. But now those jobs are coming back with further rise in living standards, except that the new employees that you are taking on using new machinery, but new machinery needs labor, and they get these jobs. Now these are jobs that they cannot completely be automated. You know, this is what we mean by real estate and uh, household management. Um, you know, now there they, they are more they, they are more jobs for cleaners and, and drivers, for example, now in a city like London than there were 20 years ago. And that's because of rising living standards, not because it's a problem about the new technologies. And that's, that's, this, that's the kind of job that I'm saying that the <coughs> sector will be, will be generating. Now, what about companies that will be doing these things? Now, of course, if, if a lot of these jobs will be, will be created by big companies. Again, there was, a, there was an interesting article that I read recently about Apple. Now, Apple is probably um, the number one company of any young person to get into, you know, like if, 
Apple advertises a job, there are hundreds of applications, they all, work, they all want to work for Apple. But if you see what jobs Apple advertises, the vast majority of them are routine jobs that, um, that you wouldn't normally want to do. You know, there are people who deliver computers, there are people who stand in their shops as security people or to show you where the computer you want to try is. Uh, and then there are the repair them, repairmen, the two repairmen as well. There are very, very few people employed by a company like Apple in the actual uh, production and um, research uh, of, um, of the return products. You look at, most people, most people employed in the iPhone development, for example, are, are people doing routine jobs that are equivalent to the routine jobs that are done in manufacturing ever in the history of manufacturing. So that's the that, that's one type of job that would be created to uh, uh, alongside the to replace the mass storage by, by machines. But then the others would be specialized service providers in small and medium sized enterprises. Again you'd be astonished by what kind of services uh, people are inventing and offering in SMEs that um, and, and those people are ones who lost their jobs in uh, sectors that have been uh, automated. Now, what that means is that if we are going to uh, avoid rising unemployment, that SMEs will need strong support because there are small companies, usually funding is missing. They, they will need administrative simplicity, simple accounts, simple uh, paperwork. You know, I'm against the idea of, paying, of uh, small companies paying um, labor taxes, for example, you know, like, uh, sort of security contributions. I think those should rise at a much higher threshold than the current thresholds in most countries. Uh, it's simply to help job creation in those companies. Because if you don't, then you're going to get uh, unemployment rising amongst uh, uh, less uh, skilled people. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the last bullet points, I mentioned earlier on that, that, that you shouldn't. The focus shouldn't all be in the small sector that we create the mass jobs. We should be paying as much attention to the, to, to the very large number of uh, jobs that will be, be created in service sectors. And if you are going to succeed in that, you have to make your business environment uh, friendly to SMEs. I'm afraid this is another uh, aspect where uh, our respective countries are, are bottom of Europe. If you look at the uh, the facilities, the ease of, of, of running business, the ease of creating new small companies. Uh, Russia and Greece occupies the, the last, uh, Russia, Greece, and the and East, Eastern countries like Romania, Bulgaria, and so on are occupying the very bottom of the uh, European League in that. And that's something that needs to uh, improve. Now, uh, in addition to that, the um, there are implications for education because traditionally education uh, prepared people to go into uh, financial services, like most of you here, uh, into um, uh, manufacturing jobs uh, and uh, office jobs generally. Uh, they didn't, they, they, there is very little education in um, our schools in order for person to person contact. In, in fact, in fact, I don't think there is any education in uh, how to deal with other people, with other people. You know, how to sell, how to look after people. And that is, it's completely absent. It, it, they, they used to offer that kind of job in what was known as home economics, but it became so unfashionable, no one that meet ever that they are learning home economics. That's, that used to be for daughters of wealthy families to go and learn how to look after their husbands. Unfortunately, something that <laughs> A, a job that's in our bed. Um, I mean, go to the wealthy house, wealthy family looking after husbands, but anyway, that's a different story. Um, now, at the same time, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and, um, and make, mathematics, sorry, <laughs> the most important I should be first. I, I mean, I, I, at the same time, that, of course, should be taught to everyone. You know, that's where technology comes from. Um, but um, the school, school curricula would, would need to change. You do hear actually CEOs of companies complaining about the way the schools are very slow to adapt their curriculum to new technology. 
and um, they, they always offered to go into schools and tell them to teach. But in a way, that's self-serving because you know, do your own training, how do you go and tell someone how to train people so they can work with But the, the, the person-to-person -person service that I can is, is very important and people do need things there. Now, we're getting, we're getting to the close, don't worry. Um, now, rewards from digital technologies can be, you know, inequality can increase enormously. And the reason is that if you discover something good in digital technology, when you discover an iPhone or a smartphone or whatever, the rewards are enormous because they are transferable across countries. We are fairly open nowadays to international trade. Uh, new companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, they, they, they make their employees, they can make their employees, especially their senior employees, extremely wealthy people. Now that means that there is a, a big increase in inequality <coughs> because also lower ranking employees working in those companies get paid a lot more than elsewhere. And that's something that's been worrying people and, and policymakers for uh, a few years now. I mean, if you, if you, are, you would be surprised if you ask any person actually what's the biggest economic problem, any econ even economist or policymaker, what's the biggest economic problem that we're going to face over the next 10 years? We will say inequality. You know, how do we deal with inequality? And the reason is that it's the nature of new technology to create these inequalities. It's inevitable, given the way we structure our capitalist societies, decentralized, based on, uh, on capitalists, based on <coughs> stock markets, and so on. We are going to get inequalities. Now, how, how, how do we deal with that? I'm afraid it, I, I, I sort of fluctuate fluctuated to my idea the other how to deal with inequality, but I think there's no escaping that it will have to be done through uh, government policy. And, and it's inevitable that there will be uh, redistribution and, and social policies. I think the way to deal with inequality is to provide very generous, at least my way here, but it's not 100% viewed by everyone, unfortunately, but who knows the time, is to provide a very generous um, uh, social support uh, to those who uh, lose their jobs and they get out until they regain a job and, um, and pay for that through the distributed taxation. Now, in, in the leading countries in these new technologies, you know, especially the United States, if, you, if I said this, you know, you would be shouted down immediately. You know, if you say any, anything, you know, the word redistribution is a dirty word. word <coughs> I guarantee you that any politician stands up and says, I want the distribution, you will lose the election. Sanders, in fact, came close to saying that. Um, which was unusual anyway, in the first place. But, that, but that can, I cannot see how you can avoid it if you want to reduce inequality. The Scandinavians, I think, got it about right, you know, the closest to Sweden, Denmark, and so on, but then their marginal tax rates are the highest in the world, and even the average tax uh, revenue in those countries is the highest in the world. Now, in order to succeed there, what you need uh, to do, what you need to have is trust in the state that it will use that money well. Otherwise, you just look for ways to avoid paying the tax. You know, a very good example I used before is if you compare Italy and Sweden, they raise about the same tax revenue, but uh, but Italy provides no social services whatsoever, whereas Sweden is number one in the world in social services. So you might wonder what happens to the money they raise. Well, if you look at the salaries of politicians, Italian politicians have the highest paid uh, politicians in the world. Now, if, if you are confronted with that kind of statistic in your Italia, obviously you'd be looking for ways to avoid paying Italian tax. You know, why should you pay Italian tax? To pay the Italian politicians to keep fighting with each other and not making much progress if you look at the Italian economy. It's the most shameful in Europe, actually, if you're worse than Greece, because there's been no growth since 1990 or something. At least Greece grew in 1990 and it's coming down again, but you know, a half is better than a flat line. <laughs> um, so you do need trust in the state that you will use the money wisely. Now, another thing that you need is the is the perception of jobs because, I mean, it's all very well to talk about almost cost disease by saying that um, these new jobs, although they will be unskilled jobs, they will be well paid and respectable jobs, but they will be well paid jobs. But they do need to be respectable jobs as well. 
if people are going to go in and do that. You know, because sometimes when I give talks of this kind, they're saying, oh, so do you expect us all to become cleaners and, uh, and nurses and, and all that? And then, you know, so my reaction is to say, why not if they're respectable and well paid jobs? Um, but then in the old manufacturing days, it's, you could also say, oh, do you expect us all to become coal miners and uh, assembly line workers? And the answer again was, was yes. You know, I mean, there is a fraction of the population who, who would be doing these unskilled jobs. But the difference now is that, um, the, 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 is that you do need to make these jobs jobs that people will want to do. And to do that, there are two things that you need. One is to be well-paid jobs. And the second one is, that, is to have the social respect that the jobs have. Now, you might say, how do you achieve that? Well, well paying, paying more in itself would make the job more uh, respectable. And you see that. But you also see various other ways in which jobs become respectable. For example, the job of a chef is now almost glamorous. You know, to say you're a chef is something you're proud of. And, yeah, and, and that's because through TV, through rising living standards that we expect better quality food, um, Chefs are the superstar. You know, the, the most popular program on, on British TV, which is causing some controversy actually, kind of, is not about cooking. It's who, who will cook the best meal. I can't remember what it's called. It's bake, bake Off. But the BBC launched and it's now losing its one of the independent broadcasts because they paid even more money, 10 million more to get it or something. That's what makes it respectable. You know, the, the, the people taking part there is uh, a superstar. Well, of course, footballers didn't quite used to be a respectable profession in, uh, 30 years ago. Again, now, it's, it, it, I think it is probably a respectable profession, isn't it? Even if you're John Terry. <laughs> That's a very crazy joke. <laughs> More people know John Terry than they probably might, actually. Um, so, um, it, you know, I mean, the argument that these service jobs are jobs that uh, <coughs> are not as good as the old manufacturing jobs or the mid-level office jobs we have, it's, it's not valid. They're not good because we don't consider them to be as good now, but with higher pay and respectability, they should get there. Okay, we'll come to the end. So the conclusion is that um, automation should be welcome and it destroys jobs because it raises living standards and, and once we realize what kind of new jobs will be created, you need some policy support, you need social support, and you need support from education, but once that's done, then you can have societies that all boring and routine jobs will be done by machines and more interesting jobs will be done by human beings. Thank you. Professor, you
you tell the person-to-person -person service, you will succeed. But what about our programmers and engineers? Will they kind of work in the future? Well, those are the ones who discover the technology that, uh, and, and we build the, the, the buildings and offices. That there would be work that I, I, I suspect actually there would be, there would be less work, there would be fewer jobs for these people than, um, than in the early industrial year. I mean, like, like if you compare, if you compare industry in 1930s, when the domestic appliances were being made, even 1950s and early 60s, and now the industry then must have employed a lot more engineers than now, I suspect. But as I mentioned with the STEM, is that it's education that has to take place because that's where, in a way, they're likely it's the jobs that, that hold the rest together and make it move forward, that the more important jobs. Yeah, it's, it's another example of jobs that may not be very respectable. I and mean, being an engineer is not as respectable socially. It doesn't have social aura, uh, sort of social respect that, that being a lawyer or accountant has, which I think is completely wrong. You started from a correlation between uh, productivity and labor hours. But what is known about the relation between productivity and Gini coefficient as a measure of inequality, and work, working hours and uh, also Gini coefficient? Uh, <coughs> this is the first question. The second yeah. is connected. The second is connected. Well, it's, it's, a very, it's a very short answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> and the second is uh, is it possible to summarize one of, the, of your ideas? that the problem is how to avoid the introduction of new technologies to produce a new social, social, uh, social explosion. Well, that, and, and that, that's the thing that I would be against, especially in the, the situation of open, open economies. Your, your first question actually is, uh, it's interesting. I, I think there is probably not a correlation between the Gini coefficient and um, productivity. I think it's probably the other. If there is one, it's, pro it's probably the other around. The more productive you are, the less inequality there is. Because we know in the course of the current development that, that countries have a lot more inequality in the early stages of growth than in the later stages. You know, like the emerging countries have a lot more inequality. The countries with the biggest inequality now, apart from Africa. Brazil, China, Russia, the, 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 the BRICS have a lot more, have Gini coefficient with a lot more inequality than uh, Europe or even North America. But then inequality has, but then Gini coefficient has been rising in terms of increasing inequality in the United States and Britain, which open up their markets and, and there will be more technologically advanced countries. So, so although, um, in quality falls with economic development and it rises again, but it, it hasn't risen to the extent that the less productive ones have. Now, now your second question, if I understand correctly, you're saying if you notice to create a more socially friendly society, a social order, to stop some technologies from being adopted. No, that, no that, that's the kind of thing I would be against on, on grounds of the economic development and, and growth. Especially if there is, um, if we're talking about traded goods, you'd be completely dominated. You see, one, one famous example where the new technology has been uh, turned down by advanced countries, the, the German name Uber, which I think, I think is still not legal to have Uber in Germany because of pressure from tax drivers. But things that that's not, that's a non trader that's, that's how we could get away with it. So I suspect that we have tried to get taxes in Germany are a lot more expensive. Convenient than, than they are in neighbor countries, neighbor countries, but you cannot, as a German, call the French to just come and take it. But, but if it was tradable, then you would suffer. Uh, it's possible to reduce the amount of machines in the industry and at the same time uh, to increase productivity in the enterprise. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
where the, the, you know, when you say around the machines, it's, it, it's technology rather than the machine, rather than the machinery. You know, like uh, computers today occupy a lot less space than they occupy any time in the past, but they're a lot more productive. But that's probably not what you had in mind, reduce the amount of machinery is technology. But I, I, I don't think it's possible though, to get more productivity out of labor and existing quality capital stock. Um, it's simply because people work with harvest in, in what they have, unless, unless they have reasons not to uh, administer restrictions and all that. You do actually maybe, yeah, I mean, no, maybe I should rewrite this slide. You could increase productivity by um, through better organizational uh, structure in an enterprise. On the assumption that the enterprise is being run well and no government interference and so on, you know, what you call the organizational cap uh, capital of the company. Once you've done that, then further the progress means new technology. But, but maybe I should stay down. I should tone down the, the, the negative answer I gave in the beginning because organizational capital is now very big in microeconomics in management. Essay where you're increasing um, productivity in a company, in an individual company, without any new additional capital stock. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, you won't want to rely on the fact that the machine cannot be display emotion, but um, with the artificial intelligence, we might consider it as a possibility in the future. Yeah. Maybe. So, yeah. and we are obviously getting at the um, at the health sector and care sector. They're the same way you could have machines that sympathize with the capital. You, I don't know. Maybe. But by that time, we're going to be the next generation of workers, so they can worry about that. <laughs> Those are the skills that they want. 
but we, uh, but CEOs of big companies that uh, very often they ask them, why don't you locate in countries where labor is cheap? You know, why would they prepare to locate in countries with very expensive labor? The immediate answer is that because they cannot find people who have basic STEM skills. So that, that, that's No, this week it's been out of the My name is Sophie, I'm a student here at Life. My question is somehow related to the one already asked. Um, what uh, can one say that the danger of this greater comfort that technologies will give us lies in the deterioration of human capital that might happen? So, for instance, if one considers the skills that a typical person possesses back in the 19th century, he or she uh, was able to play musical instruments you know, drawing, of drawing, uh, of some extensive cooking, uh, of navigating. Even if, we, uh, even if one compares to the Middle Ages, people were really good at navigation, so they could easily spot stars. So they possessed a greater variety of skills uh, than uh, nowadays people possess. So, uh, according to some statistics, only 4% of people uh, can go into an extensive scientific inquiry. And all the rest, 96% of people, they just remain the vast masses who occupy some uh, many other jobs. So, I cannot say that uh, this uh, automation will uh, deteriorate uh, people as individuals, as those who are originators of innovation. Thank you. Well, it, well, it doesn't have to be. I mean, they, I mean, certainly the case that there is more, uh, there is more specialization, is knowledge expansion. <coughs> but um, if you're going to learn more of the uh, the new techniques that are being used, of the things that we know, you know the, the, the shoulders of giants become bigger and bigger, <laughs> and, and you cannot stand on too many at the same time, unless you are uh, you are with the rich or something. You know. um, but it doesn't mean that the, that human nature will deteriorate because, from as you can see now, to work and what Kate was saying, and all that you will have more time for your for your leisure activities. You, know, you will still be reading uh, books and um, getting and, and learning how to cook innovative things and uh, going into the arts. I, I don't think a job. No, I think the biggest danger actually is uh, Facebook. To what you mentioned, because instead of doing things to enrich your life, you're just chatting with your friends. No, chatting is okay, so just putting pictures of yourself on Facebook and commenting on those of others, which I don't think that improves the quality of life very much, but it's improved the quality of Mr. Zuckerberg quite a lot the quality of life. But I don't think technology is really in that way. Thank you very much for the very thought-provoking and insightful lecture of the audience report. And you have all this, I have another question, because uh, much of the audience are uh, economists, and they are students of economists. You are not an economist? No, I am. So I have a question, I'm going to help myself as well. The question is that, uh, uh, given that Pichi described, what, what economists will be good for in the future? They are not really stand people. What economists will be good for? Yeah. What skills will they work? Well, uh, academics is a good idea. What people will be capable of doing the business, the industry, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Engineers and scientists and mathematicians, they have to provide some yeah. senses. What kind of skills do these young people need to acquire to be good in the business and be useful in the future? Well, there's one, one great philosopher, I can't remember which one, he was here, Herodotus. He said there are three types of people in the Agora. You know, in the marketplace, there are those who go to sell, those who go to buy, and those who go to observe. And the last group are the philosophers of life, but those are the economists, I think, of the future. Of, of observe life and, um, and companies and, and make sure that they use the optimum, their resources optimum. But maybe, and economists is a general profession, probably not be as useful as specializing within the economics. Just like in everything else as it develops, I mean, it's still a young, young science. So you need to specialize. Most of you are specialized in finance anyway. Though. Finance has a future.
because people can get more and more money in the world. <laughs> inventing, inventing ways of avoiding the tax money. <laughs> we will always, we'll always have a future. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a related uh, this question. So some of these audience probably will go to work at the universities, or some already have these jobs. I myself five years here in Moscow and here in Mexico as an assistant professor. Okay, so I'm concerned about the future of these type of jobs. So two things. One is with online learning. Don't have any more restrictions of class size. So, so you say, say again, one is? One is with online learning, like Coursera and other things. We don't have any more class size restrictions. So probably we'll have really less professors in the future. On the other side, it seems that a good teacher must publish. And what we see that uh, uh, most of articles I never read, and those just cited like a small proportion of these articles from top journals, maybe top 50 journals, and not all of them. So, what do you think we need to do to maintain this profession? That, that, that's, that's the nature of research, though, for your second question. It's the, it's the nature of research that, um, that you just produce and produce, and then a small minority will be. be Influential as that will catch the imagination of others and move it forward. Um, I mean, some people have made, in fact, through my career, I would the view that you shouldn't even have to prepare you know, and just publish everything. But then, if you don't have the first stage screening, it will become too much and then you're going to lose sense of what's there. So, the only, the only function of the FAE is not that it tells you an important paper and publishes, it's more like you clear out. The ones that are obviously not going to make it, and then all the others, a small minority will make it. That, that's the nature of uh, R&D, and the ones who make the discovery and the ones who get all the awards, you know, winner takes all today's economic organization. That's why I say you call it a problem. How, how do you reward failures? You know, in, in inventing, you know, inventing the next generation of telephones, for example, in um, I was once in a in a very enlightened um, in an enlightening um, speech given by the uh, CEO of AT and T, and and he was saying that in the mid 2000s, 2005, it was it was obvious that it was going to be a next generation of telephones, and um, they thought the smartphone was going to be a complete failure, and Apple was going to be wrong. I didn't happen. They didn't put any resources into developing their smartphone. And that's why AT&T was the principal telephone provider before 2005 in the United States, and now no one knows it. Okay. You know, now you see Samsung, Apple, it's, it's all smartphone. But, but then a good company, and that's what he was getting at, you mentioned, is to, is to realize now that it has even more applications that it already has, and we're developing a new technology, which he described as um, watching TV on your smartphone, you know, being able to catch TV uh, transmissions. So uh, that, that's, that's the nature. You, you make mistakes in your R&D, and it's really a way where you have to pick up these successes and learn uh, from them. Move on. on online teaching is, is of a different kind from uh, what you have as the articles that no one cites. Um, in that, that, that does have a, a, a future. That, that actually, I mean, I have to say both ignorance and, and puzzle me in a way because I remember, I remember the first time that uh, I was exposed to uh, pre recorded lectures, which was even before, it was before the internet, it was 1984, when I went to um, <coughs> Princeton University for, for a semester. <coughs> And one of the, the professor in fact, the professor I went to see was a total believer that the uh, lecturing was going to be replaced by uh, those big uh, video tapes that we used to have. Eight, what was it? Or something? Eight? <coughs> Do you remember the technology that we used to have? VHS. Yeah, VHS, yeah. And he was recording all these lectures on, on VHS and 
talking to marketing people and how to market it so that the daily president was saying to me, oh, you're a city at the end of the season, the technology you're going to do is how to do, you're going to have no students. This is how students are going to learn. But, but it hasn't. I mean, like, the number of students is increasing rather than decreasing. And this has, I don't have the answers to why that's the case, but it is the case. I'm not, I'm not at all worried by online teaching, but I think it's a good thing that to the extent that it reaches people in countries where they don't have this facility, you know, many African countries, for example, do have internet that they can take that up, that they don't have it. But, but I don't think the, the teaching, the personal presentation, where they come the way it's been moving for the last, uh, for the, for the 30 years. <coughs> I will not tell you the professor's name. I'm not tired of you. Dear colleagues, excuse my interruption, but uh, time came to finish our lecture, but maybe last question. Do you want to propose that robots will compete with us in every part of our life? So, for example, they will uh, fight with us to win a Nobel Prize as you. They will fight with Barcelona and Champions League, or even World Cup if they have the gap with Oscars. So, the final point, uh, is it possible that they will compete with us for managing the world at all? So, you can for, for man managing? For, yeah, this contemporary, uh, this contemporary leaders. Yeah. I'm sure if I say no, someone will say I've, I've seen an example where the robots managed, managed the world. Maybe, maybe. Why, why not actually? Because it's more impersonal. You know, one of the big issues in offices is that the managers do favor us to one person and go against another person. Robots will never have that risk, so it would be a good thing to But I can't see why not, why we cannot have an organization. Dear colleagues, let me to them thank you very much. Thank you very much.